Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to be um, we're going to be switching gears here, and uh, so this session is on clinical trials and progress. Uh, I'm Bob Mozer, and my co-moderator is Naomi Haas. Uh, and um, so we had a wealth of uh, of submissions, uh, uh, and very difficult to choose one over the other. So uh, the, the the plan is to have all the uh, abstracts uh, briefly uh, reported to you. And then uh, following that, we'll have kind of the question and answer period so we don't, so we don't run out of time. So um, maybe the uh, presenter for the first study, uh, Dr. Neil Shah, can uh, um, present results of the Stellar 002 trial in progress. Hello, yeah. Thank you, Bob. So first I would like to thank Dr. Mozart, uh, my co-investigator, Excel Access team, and the committee for allowing us to present our trial. I'm going to talk about Zenzalitinab, also called Zenza, in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Design of renal cell carcinoma expansion stage of stellar O2 study. So Zenzalitinab or Zenza is a novel TKI, which inhibits like VEGF, MAT, and TAM kinases. By inhibiting these pathways, it inhibits tumor growth, angiogenesis, and promotes immunopermissive environment. A preliminary data from ongoing phase one, B, phase one study, first in human stellar O1 study, has shown promising clinical activity and manageable safety of zenzalitinab in advanced solid tumors, including RCC. PD1, CDL4, and LAC3 are distinct immune pathways that regulates T cell growth and promotes tumor uh, inhibition. The preclinical pre data of zenzalitinab in combination with this immune checkpoint inhibitors has shown decreased tumor growth and uh, promotes uh, immune permissive environment compared to either Zenza alone or ICI. In this trial, we are studying this zenzalitinab in combination with PD-1, CDL4, and LAC3 inhibitors. Stellar O2 study design, it includes two arms, dose escalation stage and cohort-specific dose expansion stage. On the slide, you are able to see cohort-specific dose ex uh, expansion stage. Dose escalation stage, uh, the primary objective of dose escalation stage is to study safety and recommended dose for cohort expansion stage. This includes patients with whom no, lo any, no longer systemic therapy exists uh, or like, you know, the current systemic therapies are not working. They're using rolling six design to find the dose for cohort specific expansion stage. The, Primary objective of cohort-specific expansion stage is to study preliminary efficacy and safety in tumor-specific cohorts. This including RCC cohort, it also has cohorts for other tumor types, including colorectal cancer, CRC, liver, lung, and head and neck cancer. It includes three RCC-specific cohort. Cohort one, which is like first-line clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Cohort two, including second-line clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and cohort six, including first line non-clear cell renal cell carcinoma. For cohort one and cohort six, no prior systemic therapy are allowed, except for one adjuvant therapy, non-VEGF-based adjuvant therapy is allowed. Cohort six include patients with papillary, unclassified, or translocation-associated uh, RCC, non-clear cell RCC subtypes. In summary, the phase, in summary, the Stellar O1 study is multi-center open label phase 1B study, uh, currently enrolling patients across multiple countries in different arms, including zenzalitinab in combination with nivolumab, zenzalitinab in combination with nivolumab plus epilinumab, zenzalitinab in combination with Nivolumab plus relatinab. Future directions, uh, stellar 304 study, uh, which is phase three open lip uh, randomized study, enrolling patients into non-clear cell RCC, randomizing patients to Nivo 
plus Zenza versus Sunitinab. It's currently ongoing, evaluating primary efficacy and safety of Zenza in combination with Sunitinab. Additional trials are in future directions with this combination of Zenza and other therapies, also in other tumor types. Uh, for more detailed information, uh, you, you can scan the QR code to find the whole list of stellar O2 studies. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. All right, and the, uh, the second trial is David McDermott on the uh, Light Spark O2-4. I like that picture of me. I was pre-COVID. <laughs> All right, it's, it was a been a rough few years. All right, <laughs> so I'm here to talk, as Bob said, about LightSpark 024, uh, which hopefully is the next big thing from the Kalen lab. Um, for the last 20 years, we've been relying on the young, smart folks in that lab to point us in important directions to target things like VEGF, MET, and most recently, with the help of all of you in this room, uh, HIF2 Alpha, uh, folks like Dr. Iliopoulos, Rugarolis, Chakraborty have all helped Bill identify new targets. And hopefully this is an, an important one that I'll talk about here. So the, the concept here is focused on synthetic lethality. So if one gene is perturbed, what's the next gene you could hit to kill the cancer cell? Uh, the thinking being in VHL null tumors, that target could be CDK4-6 um, based on work looking at um, synthetic lethal screens with RNA libraries and chemical compound libraries from the Kalen lab, both in cell culture and in in vivo models. It looks like um, targeting CDK4-6 is active alone and potentially more active in combination with HIF-2 alpha blockade. And the, this concept potentially is similar to the concept we see in breast cancer where you target the estrogen receptor and CDK4-6 in, in the same tumor to good effect. So here's the trial, uh, LightSpark 024, as Bob described, it's sort of a phase one, two, where we try to find the proper dose of the combination. Both of these drugs are FDA approved, um, belsudafan and halocyclib, but not FDA approved together. So the phase one will try to find the right dose and then go to phase two immediately randomizing patients uh, two to one from the combination versus belzutifan alone. Uh, it's a pretty standard second line population. Patients have to have received VEGF and PD-1 either alone or together and then progressed. All IMDC uh, groups are allowed. Sarcomatoid is allowed. You see the the randomization here. And right now we're in the dose escalation phase of this trial. So there's obviously many trials available in second line, but we certainly need more. So hopefully this could be something that helps us build on the most active targeted therapy for kidney cancer we've had so far with HIF2 blockade and belzutifan. We know monotherapy is active. You all have shown that we don't hopefully um, we'll see it a positive pivotal trial with Belzutifan versus Everlimus sometime in the next 12 months, and we can build off that by combining CDK inhibition with Palbo and HIF2 inhibition with Belzutifan. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, David. Uh, let's see, the next, the next two are by Tony. Yeah, thank you um, for having me here. This has a, been a labor of love with Sameta study that started uh, many, many years ago, that concept hitting uh, MET as a target in uh, papillary renal cell uh, RCC. We had uh, had several trials and um, multiple failure, and we're going to have hopefully another shot on goal here um, with Sameta. Sameta is a phase three trial, is the only I would say um, the only biomarker-based randomized trial registrational in RCC. I want to exclude the signature, but I want to just focus on uh, MET, MET-directed therapy. This is not, you know, a signature here. Uh, my disclosures, and um, in terms of background, 
We know that the second most common histology is papillary renal cell cancer, accounting maybe for 15% of uh, cases. High incidence of uh, metastases in papillary RC if you look at all of them, but of course there is heterogeneity in the clinical uh, behavior. This is not new. We knew for a long, long time. Martin Littenhan caught you in the 1990s, but even around that time, we knew that many papillary RCC were MET driven in part result of genomic abnormalities along the MET pathway, the TCGA, you know, confirmed that work from the French also uh, confirm, confirmed that. And uh, a, a part of papillary RC, probably between 30 and 40% are driven at least in part by papillary renal cell cancer. We ran initially a study with a dual VEGF MET inhibitor by the name of foretinib in renal cell cancer. This didn't take it to the next stage. The focus at that time was pazopanib. It was a GSK compound. And we went again with a pure MET inhibitor with savolitinib, where we saw only responses happened in uh, MET-driven um, renal cell cancer. Uh, papillary renal cell cancer. We ran at that time a phase three trial by the name of Savoir that uh, you know was poorly accruing and uh, at some point stopped for multiple other uh, consideration. And of course, at that time, it was uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor entered and they do have, have activity in papillary RC. So we needed to go to the next um, you know, level to design a study where immunotherapy could be, um, you know, brought in. And that led to Sametta, uh, where uh, Sametta is currently accruing uh, patient and open in the United States, France, many other countries, the UK. It's led by Tom Powell's, myself, with Bob and uh, Danny Hang and a large group of investigators. So a patient with uh, papillary renal cell uh, cancer get their tumor um, sequenced, um, and let's say 30-40% have a MET-driven uh, alteration. And we defined that based on uh, several other uh, trial uh, by a chromosome 7 a duplication or uh, MET uh, mutation in the tumor or germline or amplification of MET or rarely but possibly uh, hepatocyte growth factor, the lichen being amplified. Uh, there are few cases where also these patients would have uh, FH mutation. In this situation, FH is what drives the tumor. So we exclude FH. So we expect around 30, 35%. These patients after having a meta alteration would be randomized two to one to one to receive a controlled sunitinib versus single agent durvalumab versus the combination of savulitinib and durvalumab in meta altered. Tom Powell's group led a study with savolitinib durvalumab in clear cell RCC, didn't show much, but in papillary renal cell cancer showed significant activity. And if you look at the subset that have met, this was an unselected population, the subset that had met alteration, the response rate were certainly uh, quite uh, high. The primary endpoint of the study that continues to accrue is PFS with your usual um, uh, secondary endpoint. So again, in summary, 30-40% um, of patients with papillary RC would have a dysregulation of the MET uh, signaling that could be, um, you know, discovered on uh, NGS uh, panel. And uh, as the MET pathway may play a role in immunomodulation, and since papillary RC could respond, unlike chromophobe perhaps, to single agent immune checkpoint inhibitor, we designed a study that is uh, conventional and uh, a study that uh, answer hopefully patient need in this uh, day and age. That's the Sametta study that I just uh, mentioned that is currently enrolling uh, patients. Me too? Yeah. Yeah. So there's another study um, here uh, with a novel HIF2 inhibitor here uh, with Eric Jonas and many other in the field, novel HIF2 inhibitor by the name NKT. 2152 that I'm gonna uh, call uh, 2152 um, overall. I don't need to tell you about the importance of HIF2 and you definitely have to be tuned tomorrow. We have a guest speaker very early morning after the rock, the run, um, still not known in the field, but he wanna take on kidney cancer. Uh, so <laughs> I hope he's not here. 
Good. So, um, so uh, this is another generation, and or I would say another HIF2 uh, inhibitor uh, here, and I barely can see. But this is a potent um, HIF2 inhibitor. Those are the xenograft model, the 786 xenograft uh, model, looking at the vehicle, the growth of the tumor in black, then several um, doses of uh, 2152. And on the right, you will see uh, two uh, downstream of HIF2 uh, going down with that uh, drug, VEGF and uh, CCND1, CDK. And then the HIF1 alpha, this is specific for HIF2 alpha. So the HIF1 alpha, you know, on the right here, which really that drug uh, don't do much. So that drug is specific to HIF1, uh, HIF2 alpha. So the goal from a phase one, typical phase one, is to identify uh, the MTD, the recommended dose for expansion. And then in the phase Phase two that we're starting evaluate the anti-tumor activity, extensive uh, PKs, NPD uh, with this drug, and collection of uh, tissue to evaluate predictive of response. So this is the phase one, those ex escalation that involve clear cell RC initially uh, not amenable to a standard uh, therapy. Uh, the criteria, the eligibility criteria are quite uh, permissive here, no limit on prior line on of therapy, even in the uh, phase two uh, setting um, overall. Of course, significant um, uh, caution about uh, learning from the Belzutifan uh, experience about uh, pulse oximetry and hypoxia and lung function, etc. And obviously, patients should not have received prior HIF2 inhibitor. Currently, the enrollment in the 2152 study is ongoing to the US, in the US, and um, we are gearing up for phase two dose expansion study. And um, off to Reno. Next up. Reina for uh, Samurai. Thank you. It's really a pleasure and honor to get to share with you this trial in progress through the NRG. It's um, GU12, a randomized phase two trial of uh, SABRE in patients with unresected RCC receiving immunotherapy. It's really been a magnanimous effort with lots of uh, individuals along the, along the way, Bill Hall, the co-PI, Felix Feng, and others. Um, we know that patients who present with de novo metastatic disease as part of the IMDC criteria actually have worse outcomes. The role of cytoreductive nephrectomy has certainly been evolving in the post um, uh, Carmina era and also in the IO combination era. Um, SABRE has really revolutionized radiation therapy for patients with renal cell carcinoma. Historically, renal cell carcinoma was classically labeled as a radio-resistant tumor, and it was largely driven by data from, um, you know, in vitro studies that looked at hundreds of tumor cell lines and normal tissue and basically radiated those tumors with low doses of radiation. And, you know, what was the tumor that resulted in the least cell kill that was RCC. And that's where it basically got its, um, you know, uh, got labeled as being a radio resistant tumor, but SABRE has actually allowed for introduction of highly focused radiation therapy that gives an intense dose of radiation that's concentrated on the tumor and actually limits the dose to the surrounding tissue. So you're actually able to treat the renal tumors with high higher doses of radiation. And you can see the um, linear quadratic model there. Basically, you get tremendous cell kill once you actually increase the dose of radiation that's being administered to the tumor. Additionally, SABRE has been associated with effective cell kill, and there's multiple other ancillary mechanisms with regards to its role on the immune microenvironment that it plays. And multiple studies have also demonstrated the efficacy of SABRE on primary RCC tumor control and also safety when given in combination with TKI therapy and IO-based treatments. And that led us to design um, NRGGU012, um, the SAMURAI trial. This is a trial that's enrolling patients who have metastatic RCC of any RCC histology. So both clear cell and non-clear cells are allowed to enroll. Patients must have their renal primary intact. So by definition, these are patients that have intermediate and um, poor risk disease. Um, at the present time, as the protocol is currently written today, um, the primary lesion size is eight centimeters or less, um, though there will be a forthcoming amendment that will expand 
expand that size up to 20 centimeters, actually, as long as DVH criteria are met. Um, you know, whether DVH criteria can be met with a tumor that's 20 centimeters, um, you know, uh, there's a, not to say it's questionable, but if they are met, then um, certainly the tumor can be treated. Um, and the lesion needs to be amenable to SABR. Um, patients will be randomized two to one to receive standard immunotherapy with all FDA approved regimens, um, plus um, the addition of radiation to the renal primary, which will be given over um, three fractions at 42 gray uh, versus just standard of care immunotherapy. Um, patients will be allowed to receive a a uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy, if one should be warranted down the line, it doesn't, the protocol does not exclude the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy. We'll obviously be looking at that. There'll be stratification factors based on whether somebody receives IOIO or whether somebody receives IO VEGF, and also stratification factors based off of IMDC risk group and also histology. Um, the primary endpoint is radiographic progression free survival. And certainly during the uh, statistical design of the study, we took into account the proportion of patients that we anticipated that would enroll that would be IOIO treated versus IO VEGF treated. And that is going to be looked at very closely. There's a series of secondary endpoints, of course, looking at overall survival, resist response, uh, time to second line therapy, the use of cytoreductive nephrectomy, and other really important correlatives, um, blood based correlatives, working with the Lang Lab and uh, George Zhao at the University of Wisconsin. Um, integrating that work. So really, this is actually the first cooperative group study to activate um, that is investigating SABRE to the renal primary. It's the first RCC study that's actually being done through NRG. So it's actually a landmark study um, to be conducted through the NCI. Um, it's histology and systemic treatment agnostic to allow for general generalizability um, to routine clinical practice. Um, and it's gonna be really exciting to evaluate an alternate modality to, the, to targeting the primary tumor in RCC beyond just surgical approaches. Um, if positive, this trial does have the opportunity to support a paradigm shift with the use of SABRE. While it is a phase two trial, um, you know, uh, you know, it's, this is, uh, SABRE is not, it's, you know, it's out in the open and anybody can do SABRE per se. So, um, but it does have the opportunity to, to cause a shift in practice. Um, additionally, the tissue and blood-based correlatives are really going to be important to analyze in the context of the study. We've already been working very collaboratively with the Cytostring Chief and Ali Khan in, in Canada and actually utilizing the platform of Cytostring to actually roll out this study as well, not just in the U.S., but also internationally in Australia <laughs> and Ireland and through other cooperative group mechanisms. So um, if you don't have this study open at your sites, please get it open. And if you want any um, uh, instruction on how to do that, you can reach out to me. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Eric Janish. Great, thanks. Uh, and that was also a pre-COVID picture. Uh, so two studies here. The first one I'm going to talk about is this phase 1B2 study of lutetium gerontuximab plus cabazantinib and nivolumab in the treatment of uh, treatment-naive patients with advanced clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And the rationale here really is that uh, replication stress is something that is a real thing in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. It looks like VHL loss itself seems to uh, predispose to that. And the secondary mutations can attenuate that or enhance that. And we have a paper that's just coming out uh, in CCR that shows that 72 mutations can actually enhance replication stress and increase sting signaling. So this is an area that we can really manipulate and modulate. And the significance here is that you can actually increase chemokine and cytokine production by the primary tumor, essentially get that eat me signal to attract immune cells into the microenvironment and enhance um, killing. So we want to, our hypothesis here is that by using moderate doses of radiation that are directed by an antibody to the tumor cells, that we're going to enhance this immune response by increasing signaling in combination with sort of conventional IOTKI therapy. So take a deep breath. The schema is complex, but interesting. What we're doing here is a single arm study where we're going to be treating up to 100 individuals. And we're going to be at baseline looking at, we're going to be using novel F, um, PET imaging to look at um, FRG uptake, which allows an FRG PET allows you to look at immune cells, uh, T cells, activated T cells in the microenvironment. We're going to do that at baseline. We're going to give lutetium gerontuximab. We're then going to do a SPECT scan, which allows you then to measure where the, the CA9 antibody actually uh, is taken up. 
And then we're going to follow then in the second and subsequent cycles with, uh, with cabozantinib and nivolumab. We're going to do biopsies at baseline, and then biopsies are going to be staggered in sort of a rolling group of patients, um, either at uh, after one cycle of treatment, uh, sort of after, after uh, triple therapy has been initiated, or at progression, and we hope to get about 50% of patients' biopsies. So this uh, study is basically going to allow us to sort of look, understand the biology with, with the um, the, the type of imaging or tissue imaging that we've talked about uh, earlier today. It's now possible to really do science on biopsies. So we'll be able to look at the immune microenvironmental state at baseline, see how these various stages of treatment modulate this. And obviously we have our clinical endpoint of increasing um, complete response rate, which is the primary endpoint of the study. So the significance here really is that uh, sting signaling has the potential to be harnessed in renal cell carcinoma, that uh, multiple therapeutic uh, strategies exist to enhance this. And that our hypothesis here is that by essentially uh, irritating, if you will, the tumor by, by enhancing replication stress, increasing double strand DNA, enhancing sting signaling, we're gonna get enhanced immune attraction into the microenvironment and we're gonna augment the effect of cabozantinib and nivolumab. So obviously this is a work of many people, uh, folks in uh, my lab, uh, clinical collaborators uh, in various uh, areas at MD Anderson, the KCRC uh, team, the Kidney Cancer Research Consortium, uh, and also the TLIX team. So I'm now gonna move on to the second study. And this is a phase one, two study of uh, PRO-1160, which is a CD70 directed antibody drug conjugate. Yeah, it seems I like antibody directed therapy uh, in patients that advanced uh, solid tumors and hemologic malignancies. And so the, uh, the rationale here is that, you know, we have a couple of cell surface antigens in renal, in renal cell carcinoma, both clear cell and non-clear cell that can be used basically as Trojan horses, horses to, to deliver payload to the tumor cells. Uh, we talked about CA9 and now we're talking about CD70 which is expressed at a very high level in clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and interestingly, at a reasonably high level in non-clear cell and papillary renal cell carcinoma and others as well. Um, and then this is basically a CD70 antibody, which has a, a novel um, hydrophilic linker, which is linked to exotecan, which is a topo-1 uh, uh, anti uh, antitumoral agent. And uh, in preclinical studies, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, ADC actually showed some pretty interesting responses in animal models of renal cell carcinoma. Now we know that uh, a number of CD70 directed ADC uh, agents have been tested. I see Monty sitting over here and Nazar over there. Uh, and we know that there were some toxicity issues and some modest, very modest efficacy and the toxicity outweighed the benefits here. The hope here is that by using a different payload that might have less myelotoxicity and also a better linker that's going to allow less, um, the, the appropriate amount of, of essentially um, um, off-target effects that we might overcome some of these limitations. Uh, this is a, uh, a study that's actually enrolling not only renal cell carcinoma, but also uh, lymphomas where this is all CD70 is also expressed at a high level, the typical sort of uh, dose escalation. And then there's going to be dose expansion in various um, diseases, including uh, renal cell carcinoma. And we'll see. So uh, the significance here really is that this is a novel ADC, perhaps overcoming some of the limitations of prior ADCs uh, with a chemotherapy payload. Uh, it um, is, uh, looks like it might be more active looking at preclinical data uh, that have looked at uh, these types of ADCs. And uh, the hydrophilic linker may also improve uh, the operating characteristics of this. Uh, the study is uh, opening at multiple sites around the country, and um, we hope to get uh, results in the next year or so. So thank you very much. Katie, you're next. Katie Beckerman. Hi. Thanks, everyone. It's a wonderful to have this opportunity to come up and share and hear all the exciting trials going on. 
Um, I'm thankful. I'm going to actually be sharing two trials, um, both with support uh, via different mechanisms through the DOD, and so just want to highlight that. I'll start first. Uh, this is a trial I presented um, as a trials in progress uh, last meeting, which was a little bit less than a year ago, and excited to give an update on this. So the background for this trial, a phase one, two trial of ipinevo and cifaradinant, um, just to give a, an understanding of what cifaradinant is and why we think it might be useful in this combination. So cifaradinant is a small molecule and it inhibits the adenosine A2AR receptor. We think that clear cell RCC biology suggests that the metabolic switch that we see, we've heard a lot of discussion about that today, how that affects the entire tumor microenvironment and that generation of significant amount of ATP in the tumor microenvironment that then gets cleaved to adenosine. So adenosine is a very important signaling molecule specifically for RCC, hence the reason we might want to target it. But not only do we think it's important in the signaling of the cancer cell, we actually also believe it's important um, in the tumor microenvironment for the other immune cells. Um, and we've heard some great talks today earlier um, by Dr. Rathmel, also uh, Dr. Hakimi has published on this, Dr. Fong, suggesting that myeloid-derived uh, cells, um, perhaps immune escape mechanisms, can be driven by an adenosine high signature. So with that, we've designed a frontline triplet trial looking at the combination of ipilimumab, nivolumab, and cifaradinant. Um, patients with clear cell RCC previously untreated. We have a safety lead-in. So I'm ha happy to be here today and say that we have put seven of the first eight in that safety lead-in on trial. Um, this is being conducted through the um, Kidney Cancer Research Consortium. And so it is. this trial is open at MD Anderson and soon to open at UPenn, um, Vanderbilt, and Duke. So we're thrilled to have um, this collaboration and, and get this trial going. Um, I want to point out that the safety, uh, the phase 1B um, has the typical safety um, and, and endpoint, but that the phase 2 trial has a what we hope to be a novel um, endpoint where we're trying to, at an earlier time period, using um, an improvement in tumor shrinkage as an earlier outcome of a prolonged response for IO-related therapy. So essentially, our efficacy endpoint is looking for an increase in the percentage of patients who achieve at least 50% tumor shrinkage, because we know based on post hoc analysis of Checkmate 214 and other IOTKIs that this uh, portends the patients that have a durable benefit. So forward looking, again, I, I just mentioned, you know, we're hopeful that this might be one of the first tests of a novel uh, efficacy endpoint, um, trying to, again, target the tumor specific microenvironment, not only attacking the cancer cells, but also having an impact on some of the immune suppressive components. And then all of our goals, obviously, is to decrease the patients who have primary progressive disease, especially those that were seen in the um, IO PD1 CTLA4 combination with a tolerable safety profile. And so next, um, it is my pleasure to be here um, to talk a little bit about this optic RCC, which was mentioned earlier on behalf of my co-investigators. Um, this also has support through the DOD as it is being run through the uh, clinical trial award mechanism. So I'm not going to go into great depth. Many of you may have been here for the biomarker session earlier today um, based on um, excellent work by my colleagues on this stage, Genentech and others. We have amassed a, a significant amount of data understanding that perhaps we can take biology and use biology to predict which patients might respond to different therapies. And again, this was done using RNA sequencing and clustering um, based on biology. And in a big sense, I think it's very easy to say that clusters one and two were driven in a mostly angiogenically way, uh, biology, and that cluster four was driven in a clusters four and five, excuse me, were driven in a T cell effector and immune responsive way. And that's what I'm highlighting there in the um, right hand side, that these patients with T effector signatures tended to respond better in the combination that had the IO backbone. So based on 
on this analysis and in collaboration, um, as you can see at all these institutions, um, as well as with our partners, Vindia uh, Data Science, we've established a um, gene expression um, biomarker driven uh, clinical trial where we're taking patients who are previously untreated, we're getting tissue from both the primary and the metastatic sample. We're defining their treatment using standard of care therapies, either cabonevo or ipinevo, based on the metastatic site, uh, if at all possible. And then using, as I just mentioned, their biology. So if they have an angiogenically driven tumor, they're being assigned to cabonevo. And if they have a T effector, immune responsive, suggestive biology, they're being assigned to ipinevo. Um, we have interim st stopping points and are comparing to historical controls looking for a 20% improvement in objective response rate compared to that historical control. And we're excited. We are open and enrolling at Vanderbilt. As I mentioned, many other collaborators all here in the room are opening uh, soon at their own sites. We have, in, we have screened 22 patients. We have six patients on and being treated in clusters one and two. We have five patients enrolled in clusters four and five. And we have four patients who have been excluded because their biology was defined by clusters three, six, and seven, where we don't quite know what to do just yet. And that leads me to my next forward looking statement. So, you know, what we're hoping is that, um, like our European partners who have already shown feasibility, that we might be able to do a biomarker driven trial um, here, that it, this could be a proof of principle concept to build upon going forward. And current activities that we're all excited about is developing kind of the next steps, looking at possibly HIF blockade and clusters one and two, again, those angiogenically driven clusters. And then lastly, trying to identify novel targets for the other clusters where we're not as sure what their biology is that's de defining their features. With that, I'm done. <laughs> So are there questions? Uh, Dr. Tanier. My, my voice is gone now. <laughs> so uh, questions, I have several, but first to Tony. Tony, uh, the Samita tribe. I, I hate to be a, uh, you know, Criticize because the trial is already uh, moving forward. But Monty is here, and he showed, you know, PAPMET that savolitinib was actually dropped out of the forearm trial, the PAPMET, you know, the S1500. Now, I see it as one of the comparator, uh, one of the arms, uh, you know, and type the L1 alone. And then you have sunitinib. And of course, Cabo is better than sunitinib. How can you justify in the combination arm to have savolitinib, which was dropped out of the uh, PAPMET as, as, a, as a, an active agent in papillary RCC? So you're combining it with an anti pdl one And then you, I mean, obviously here, there should have been Cabo here uh, in that, uh, you know, comparison for Samita. So um, let me tell you, I, I it really, I overall disagree. One is that SAVO has no activity in unselected population. In a selected population with checkpoint inhibitor, I don't know if Tom, this we presented 70% response rate with their valumab, around 65%. So in an unselected population or it met negative, it has no activity. But so this is in MET positive. If you're MET negative, those 65%, you are not eligible for the trial. That's one. We tried to, the, at the time of the design, I mean, we could not wait. PAPMET was just, you know, the results were there. Monty presented it. I would argue to think about PAPMET. PAPMET does not have an overall survival benefit. One, despite the response rate and the PFS. And second, cabozentinib is not standard in many places. This is a global study where still folks accept sunitinib. So in the middle, we were trying to do um, dealer choice of sunitinib or cabozentinib just to marry you know, both angles. But then the problem will be what the PFS in a primary endpoint, a study where the primary endpoint is PFS. We could have done for OS, but that's a 500, 600 patient study meant driven. That means you have to screen 1200 patients with papillary RC. So we met somewhere 
and uh, we're gonna we're gonna decide. But I do think there is um, equipoise in the study, and I will put patients on. Tom. Um, do you think, like, you know, chemotherapy is not being super successful um, in clear cell renal cancer, and ADCs are, in some respect, just targeted. Some people say the linker molecule is complicated, but it's a form of targeted chemotherapy. But your radionuclide piece that looks like super exciting. When you look at those two, do you not just favour going down that second route more aggressively? Do you think we should pursue both or put all our energy into the radionuclide? Um, experiments. I, I think I, I would just think more broadly that what well, there's two parts to this. There's one is being able to deliver payload precisely, and the second part is to figure out what the right payload is. And I'm going to be agnostic at this point in time as to what the right payload is. And but the strategy of using, you know, as has been so successful in bladder cancer and in other solid and liquid tumors, using antibody directed therapy as a way to actually enhance efficacy at the site of the tumor, I think is a good strategy. Now we'll see, you know, we can have a conversation in a year or so, whether or not this novel linker with a chemotherapy is of any use, we'll find out. Um, I am optimistic about the, uh, the, the radiopharmaceutical strategy, but again, I think we have to be very careful about what is it that we want to do with radiation? Because blasting something with radiation is not necessarily the right thing to do. What we want is we want to have the right dose of radiation. I think that's probably sort of a, an idea in general that we should pursue for, for renal cell carcinoma. Hi. Um, yeah, I just, I wanted to ask Katie. First, I, I was going to ask the question about CABO and, uh, and that's been answered. Or not answered, but Katie, the um, the alpha two uh, adenosine alpha two receptor inhibitor that's been around for a while, and yes, it definitely hasn't been uh, in, uh, used ipi nevo. It's it's been looked at with nevo, and the results are are poor. That doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. It's just a background. But the group, Corvus, got all hot and heavy about B cells. And basically, at least when I was there working with them, you know, they, they turned the whole concept that it was really B cells that made a difference and immunoglobulin, and they wanted to go at viral uh, related tumors. So, I don't know if you're going to invest a gate uh, B cells at all. Hello. Oh, there we go. Um, th that's a great comment. I think we're going to try to look at some biology regarding the mechanisms. Um, maybe just to take a step back and say that there's been some preclinical preclinical data, which is maybe the best that we're going to get, where the combination of cifaradinate and A2AR receptor looks promising with the combination of a CTLA-4 inhibition. Um, and so that was part of the rationale for using this combination. Um, and yes, there I have heard a lot of excitement from the company about uh, B-cell modulation, and I think they have a developmental pi pipeline that is also working towards that, um, but can't, can't comment any further. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, really brilliant panel of um, trials on display here, and I'm um, optimistic about all the advances you all will find um, for our patients with kidney cancer. Um, I have a question that's been bothering me quite a bit in a broader sense, um, and um, the Samita question really drills this to play. So when there are multiple trials that are ongoing and trials result during the time frame of a trial that's still ongoing, <laughs> Um, how do you all think about designing trials that will continually be relevant? I mean, it, it's the worst thing for a trialist because we cannot move in real time. There's no way to move in real time, even if you have an adaptive design or, you know, you put an umbrella study or you open, it's not possible. So, I mean, part of it is, is reading the future well. Part of it is luck, like with pedigree. You know, pedigree is a study that started by nevo ipi Then based on response, patients stop, um, you know, the NEVO, 
get to Nivo Cabo randomization or get to Cabo. Surprisingly, with all the changes, it stood the test of time. So partly to your hard work for sure, but also we were lucky. There is no doubt. I think th those are the thing. And sometimes you can't, there isn't enough patient and money this to have a million trial open at the same time. So I think the luck factor is very important. And sometimes you have to cut your losses and um, move quickly. I mean, it has been my approach, unless you're missing hmm. on something. Mm -hmm. Bill? Oh, I, was, I had a different monitor. question. But, uh, you know, on the optic trial, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to pick on it, but I really hate it. I mean, I don't even know why it's being done. It will answer no question. And really, do we have any doubt in 2023 that you could choose to use RNA-seq to assign patients to one of two arms? That's the only feasibility aspect of this trial. There's no safety questions. And, 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 and you're actually presuming the hypothesis is correct, that the signatures uh, are useful for... I, picking the right therapy. So you are going to now compel these patients to go on treatments based on this RNA signature, but why not do a trial that actually answers the question of whether RNA-seq informed therapy is better than dealer's choice? Uh, the only justification I can see for this is quote unquote feasibility, but really do we doubt that you could use an RNA signature to assign patients? I, I, don't, I don't see the feasibility challenge. It's not a safety challenge. It, it's, it seems like a pedestrian trial that will answer no questions, really. So I'm, I'm sorry to be that blunt, but that's, well, unless I'm missing something, which is quite possible. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, no, I certainly appreciate all, all criticism and, and constructive feedback. You know, that is what we are all here to do is to learn from each other, right? And so I, I think the reason we um, endeavored into this study was, as you just very well stated, it doesn't seem like a large jump to say somebody's biology, the tumor of their biology is suggested by RNA sequencing, which um, many of the people on this stage and in the room have, have shown correlates with either historical response, but it hasn't uh, in, until bionic um, hadn't been tested in a prospective fashion and hasn't been done in kidney cancer in a way that we've done a biomarker uh, specific trial. So. It, it was a feasibility attempt, uh, partly just, just to add that um, much of our RNA sequencing efforts, um, looking in a retrospective way, even if it's a pre-specified analysis, has like normalized across you know, patient samples. Whereas um, here on this clinical trial, one patient's coming in, that patient is not getting normalized across an entire batch, but rather on an individual patient decision having to create that pipeline, if you will, to, to make the success of the trial. So I don't know if that answers. Well, it question. sounds like we agree on the hypothesis, but I, I would just say, okay, let's do a trial that tests the hypothesis. This categorically will not test the hypothesis. Why not randomize patients to RNA-seq informed assignment versus dealer's choice and see if it actually matters? Or yeah, not. yeah. No, I, I definitely understand that point. And, and I think to that point, uh, that would obviously be our next next step and next hope. This this was truly a, a feasibility. Can we get the tissue? Can we get it to RNA? Can we uh, define it and get a patient on trial? So so just one, to, to try to design the next study, Bill, like that. Because we, we struggle, you know, with many of these signature, but at least I give credit to folks for trying to do this pain in the neck trial. It's just impossible. The number, the return on investment, especially if the trial is negative, four number of hours put in, will, when you talk to lawyers, they would laugh at us because they, they bill by the hour. Um, so, uh, so perhaps agreeing you do, um, so how do you design the study? So you randomize patient to, I would say, uh, you randomize them and the randomization, randomization says uh, RNA seek informed yes, no. If no, you just give them, let's say, Cabonivo, whatever we agree on one. And if yes, based on what they have, they get one out of two combination. But then how do you compare the three arm? If the, if the RNA seek combination comparable to what? To the other, you know, arm by the RNA seek informed or to the non RNA seek informed? Because then it's a huge trial. Yeah, I'm going to say something. Can I say something? 
uh, you're not Bill, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then Monty will say something, but I was going to hand it to you. So I, I like this study. I think it's innovative. I think we've seen enough studies where we do you know, the drug that we kind of feel we know isn't going to work, but we're going to have a go. Um, this is innovative. We're doing something new. Can we do it successfully? I'm not sure we can. If we can turn it around successfully, this will open a new chapter. RNA sequencing is important. I don't think it's the end of the biomarker story, but you know, we've talked about this before in kidney cancer. When we look at the bladder cancer community and the lung cancer community and the prostate community, their biomarker work is going much, much faster than our biomarker work. We are reaching a plateau, in my opinion, of drug development. We're targeted immune checkpoints, particularly with PD-1, and that's been successful. And obviously the VEGF targeted group, that's been successful, but we haven't got this new um, this new oasis of targets out there. And I think we are not selecting patients well at the moment. Our attempts haven't been successful. And this is a new attempt. The Bionic study and this study are going to together identify whether this is feasible. And if it is, we can then extend this. I don't think this is the end, but this is the beginning of a really important chapter. I see it as a phase one type trial rather than a phase three. And you don't need to have the phase three when you do the phase one. What you need to be able to do is say, yeah, in the US, we can do this successfully. And if you do, you can then build on that and so this is the foundations of the future of kidney cancer in my opinion so i think it's really important i was going to say exactly what the mom said <laughs> All right. okay can, can we at least can we at least agree though you ultimately have to get to a randomized trial where it's rna sequencing that chooses the therapy versus its random assignment to the arms you have to do that otherwise because the null hypothesis is it's true, true, and unrelated, and you will not improve upon therapy by using RNA sequencing to make the choice. So in a properly powered randomized trial, you should be able to show me that RNA sequencing used to choose the therapy is better than random assignment to whether there's two arms or three arms, whether, you know, to, can we agree that that's where you have to get? Yeah, that is, that uh, is think, the hope that that's what we're yeah, so I, I think we, so we can, we'll start with what we can agree upon. Uh, so if you want to bet money later on whether this is quote unquote feasible or not, I'm happy to take that bet. Yes, it's feasible. Okay. And so you'll get some provocative data in two or three years, and then you'll be back where I think you should be, which is designing the randomized trial. Laurent. Yeah, I think the feasibility has already been demonstrated with the bionic trial. And, and that's more than 150 patients randomized. And at that time it was a frozen sample. So it, it was actually even more demanding. So my feeling is that Bionic failed in the way they randomized because it was lacking the IOTKI arm. But otherwise, our ability to have proper uh, tissue processing and as well as, you know, like using a classifier that has been demonstrated. To Reina's comment uh, um, earlier, it was not the perfect classification because that classification was done at the time of TKI only, when now we want to have a more sophisticated classification. But really, to me, unfortunately, optic will not provide evidence that we should use that prospectively. So I'll be tempted to say that, yeah, we do need randomization at a larger scale. Yeah. Do we have to move on? No, no. no, no. We got a, a few more minutes here. We got about three more minutes. Okay. So when Bill started asking Katie questions, I had a flashback to like 15 years ago when he was criticizing our work with IL-2, it was very similar. It was just coming in this direction. <laughs> um, but so, so a couple of things in addition to what has been said, I think we all agree on where we need to get to, but ultimately for those studies to happen, we have to insist on them because they need to be funded. So one of the issues with this is it's been funded, but my guess is the funding, correct me if I say something wrong, is probably less than you would have liked to do a study of this size. Just doing the RNA sequencing alone probably takes up a big chunk of the budget. So we need to figure out a way to convince our industry colleagues, many of whom are in this room, to support these trials if they're gonna actually happen. So saying that the optic trial should be this and that and this, it can't be based on the amount of funding it has, probably. But ultimately, when you get to the question, and this goes back to what Sabina and Mike did with the IL-2 select trial, people argued when we started that trial that we knew the answer. You know, we knew that, not that any of you in the room remember what the answer was, but the answer was that clear cell histology plus CA9 staining predicted for IL-2 benefit. 
People took that as gospel. They even wrote it in the stupid ASCO education book, right? And, the board. and, and then we did the trial and the properly designed trial was to test it. Yes, no, was it right? Test it in all comers, not just to assign people based on the marker, but to, and we found out that it predicted for benefit in both groups. So if we had just studied the CA9 high patients, the study would have been positive, but patients did just well with high dose IL-2 in the low CA9 group. The group we would have predicted a priori wouldn't have done well. So ultimately the trial needs to be bigger and you need to we need to test these markers and people we think that would benefit and those that don't. Otherwise we don't have anything. Is that, Tamina, you shake, would you agree with what I just said? There's, and Mike, there we go. All right, so I can, but it was so nice to not be on the end of that question. <laughs> oh, oh my God, it was awesome. Actually, I think the only place you can do that trial, if you can, is in a cooperative group where, where there is enough centers or non-centers, but in practicing positions who I think would be able to do it if you can, if you can get the genetics. But honestly, I think in a, in a non-objective, uh, uh, impartial uh, study, which is run by anyone else, there's no way they're going to do it. I mean, you know that any of the big players will not do a study like this. One, I guess we're going to do one last question. Well, let, let Mike answer and then. Oh, OK. I guess we'll do an answer and one last question. For that comment, uh, I think that study was proposed five years ago to the cooperative group, and it was turned down by the steering committee after two or three years. And so what we've been left is, is what we can do without cooperative group support and without industry support, which is an institution paying for the RNA seek and getting some support from the DOD to try to run the trial. If we wanna answer true questions, then we've gotta put them into cooperative group studies or get our industry colleagues to support them. All right, one, one last, uh, one patient per, uh, question over there that's been. Thank you, Dr. Mozart. Last question. So Dr. Beckman, I'll take you off the hot seat by asking what's hopefully more about softball question to you. I'm just really curious what the mechanism you're using for assigning these patients based off their RNA profiles is in a prospective manner. My understanding is it's a little bit different than what Dr. Mozart and Dr. Rini did in their cancer cell paper. Um, could you just speak to that a little bit more and how that's being done? Yeah, so logistically that, um, again, I wanna thank our kind of data science partners uh, of India, they're here and they'll be giving a talk later and um, I'm sure would be happy to kind of have some more offline conversations as well. So it is based on the Emotion 151 signatures, but, but um, to your point, it is not exactly that signature and it does take into account that we're not normalizing across, you know, 800 patients all at once. Um, so I would say yep. informed by, by those prior signatures, but then having to assign uh, treatment based on every individual that's coming in. Or is it still being, you know, a human driven model? It's based yeah. on machine learning. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up this great session and thanks, thank you to all the presenters for presenting the trials and the great discussion. Uh, we're going to be